welcome and thank you all for joining us for this episode of the Crexy Podcast, an insider's look at all things commercial real estate. In this show, we cover a broad range of topics that both cater to CRE newcomers and industry leaders alike. I'm your host, Ashley Kobovich, Regional Director at Crexy a comprehensive digital commercial real estate platform designed to empower all CRE real estate professionals with the tools they need to discover and transact property. As a part of that mission, the Crexy podcast hopes to provide a window into the inner workings of commercial real estate for this generation and the next. Today, we are thrilled to sit down with Austin Clemens. Welcome, Austin. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's very exciting to be here today. Of course, of course. For all of you listeners, Austin is the founder and partner at Slauson Co., a venture capital firm that focuses on economic inclusion. Before forming Slauson Co. in 2020, Austin was a former principal at 10110 Ventures, where he played a role in investing in over 50 companies across two funds, primarily focused on B2B and SaaS. These companies include Ordermark, Crexy, Emotive, Second Spectrum, and Daily. Austin mainly focuses on tools and platforms that support small businesses. A champion of inclusion in the LA tech ecosystem, Austin is a founding chairman for Pledge LA, which is a citywide initiative that promotes diversity, equity, and inclusion in tech. In addition, he actively supports the expansion of nonprofit accelerator Grid 110, a mission-focused organization clearing pathways to success for early-stage entrepreneurs of all backgrounds. Austin is a graduate of Morehouse College, holds an MBA from NYU Stern School of Business, and is currently a Kauffman Fellow. Austin, again, welcome to the podcast. We're excited to have you. Let's go ahead and dive in. Sounds great. Let's do it. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, so our first topic, uh, Austin, is we want you to walk us through your story. So how'd you first get into venture capital? And since then, how has your journey unfolded? Sure. Happy to talk about it. Um, uh, you know, everybody's path into venture capital seems to be pretty different. It's a it's a very sort of cottage industry, meaning like most of the firms are, are actually pretty small, fewer than 10 people in most cases. And so um, uh, it's it's usually you get in it's a very relationship oriented thing i guess probably not too dissimilar to commercial real estate um yep. uh in, in, in many ways but the uh you know in my case with venture capital it started my started my career in investment management it was uh in private wealth management specifically um managing high net worth client portfolios it was kind of there that i fell in love with the idea of investing and um and uh, kept up with the markets and things like that. But I didn't really know much about venture capital. It was mostly public equities and uh, fixed income portfolios. Um, but then I ended up leaving that role to start a business. I was doing web and mobile development for a lot of small businesses in and around LA and then also in New York. Um, and that was uh, that role is where I really got to gain a whole new appreciation for working with entrepreneurs which was a huge deal for me. Um, uh, just really seeing that entrepreneurs to me feel like the most passionate people on the planet. They're, they're you know, leaving everything behind to, to go work on their idea or pursue some something and bring something to the world that they feel that needs to exist. So working with entrepreneurs and, and building technology for them, and then also coupled with the background in investing, um, I started to hear more and more about venture capital and thought that it was the perfect combination of those three things. Um, so I ended up going to business school to try to uh, get into venture capital um, and break my break into the industry. And um, after I graduated, not too long after I graduated, I ended up landing a role at a firm called 10110, which was a very, very proud to say a very early investor in Crexy. Awesome. I love that journey for you. Um, it, it, it's great to see that through your experience, you were able to follow your passion and, and it led you to where you are today. So on, on that journey, uh, and one of the things that our listeners really love is talking about our mentors, right? So there's always people along the way that guide us, 
into the path that we want to be on or, or make sure that we're continuing on that path. So who were some of your mentors along the way, Austin? Um, and what are some of the favorite lessons that you either learned from them or just through your experience? Sure. Um, you know, what's early, what's funny is early in my venture capital career, like my mentors were the, were the few VCs that were very actively blogging. Um, you know, where I'm from, <laughs> I grew up in South LA. There weren't a lot of, weren't exactly a lot of venture capitalists walking around. It was, again, I didn't even hear about the industry till I was, uh, in my mid twenties, basically. So, um, so, so for me, all, a lot of my early exposure came from the Brad Felds and Fred Wilsons and Mark Sewsters, who were uh, whose blogs are, are still all very active right now. So anybody looking to learn more about the the industry, I, I'd still recommend that you check those out. But this is back in like 2009, 2010, uh, coming out of a you know a economic recovery, starting to to see an economic recovery. Uh, and really starting to see a lot of growth and opportunity, I started reading those blogs and those that sort of opened up the 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 door. I think uh, venture capital and private equity broadly is is usually notoriously opaque. And these were some folks that very early on decided that there was uh, reason to shed light on what's happening behind the scenes in the industry. And for me, undoubtedly, without those blogs, I would not have been able to make it into the industry. But uh, in the industry, I, I would have to give, you know, a, a key mentor is David Waxman at 10110. You know, he was the guy that, that opened the door for me and let me get, you know, foot in the door in the industry. And in terms of lessons learned, you know, watching him, like, <laughs> above all else, David's a, actually a really good person. And, um, you know, like, ethically sound and like, and, and just the type of person that, wants to work hard and, and, and create value. And, uh, and, and I think I just admired that you could be in a, in a role that could be potentially pretty lucrative, but you don't have to be a jerk about it. Like you can, you can actually just be a good person and a nice person and, uh, and, uh, and, and do well in the business. So that was another thing that attracted me to it. So I, I, I'd give David also a huge, uh, uh, nod in terms of who, who would be a mentor of mine. And then a, a few more along the way, but I'll, I'll pause there. That's awesome. Uh, you you said a lot there. First and foremost, would love you know. I'll, I'll send David a LinkedIn request as well. Um, seems seems like a great guy and, and able to pull you in. So kudos there. Um, a couple of things that you said is is reading the blogs and going after things yourself. Uh, I love that. Um, I'm in sales myself and have been throughout my whole career and. Uh, key key metric there is always be selling, but I always love always be learning, right? So teaching yourself, um, everything is out there, especially with the age of the internet. So awesome. And we'll definitely ask you at the end uh, some tips and, and other things that you'd recommend for our listeners here, but those are definitely some, which is awesome. I agree. I, I think that there's quickly, I mean, there's a, a to me, I always say that in venture capital is the most intellectually stimulating job you could possibly have. Where basically they're experts from every single category or people that are dedicating their next decade to to building out something new in a category, and they're talking to you about the future of it. And you know, and and bring first of all, they have to bring you up to speed very quickly on the basics of whatever their industry is. Um, you know, I give the example frequently of like. When I was at 10110, you know, I had to get brought up to speed on everything around satellite imagery in a week and a half. And like, you know, I don't know of another instance where I would have had to do that. Um, but in this industry, it affords the opportunity to, to dive deep into topics that you would have never, ever had opportunity to think about. Absolutely. It's something new every day, which is super exciting. <laughs> every day. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It's, it's great to hear your story. So to dive deeper into that, um, kind of on the opposite side, so those are great lessons. What are some of the challenges that you faced in your career and, and how did you overcome them? Um, I think probably one of the challenges was, uh, it was, <laughs> Okay, I think one of the challenges is is really thinking about 
um, accepting what is obvious to me that might be non-obvious to other investors. Um, and, and, and inherent is that in that is, uh, is something that now we say at Slosman Co., my firm, um, which is that your lived experience is your competitive advantage. Um, you know, I think that when I would see things before, like say, for example, I, I would see, I'd meet founders that probably didn't fit the traditional Silicon Valley profile, but I would know them and their story because of my experience and dealing with people like them. Um, and then from there, I would, I would be able to say to myself, like, this person's going to succeed. Like this, this is the type of person that's, you know, a high achieving person, uh, that's, that's going for it. And, you know, they're not going to take a mediocre outcome for, you know, for, for themselves. Like they're swinging for the fences. And I think that some of those signals from my personal experience, it could be things as simple as what school you went to. Like I went to Morehouse and, and, uh, which is a historically black college in Atlanta. Um, you know, if I if I meet somebody that went to Morehouse or went to Spelman or went to Howard or something like that, um, I view them similar to the way that somebody in Silicon Valley might view somebody who went to Stanford. Like, uh, I know what it means when you went to Morehouse, when you went to Spelman, when you went to Howard. I know the pride that you take. I know the network that you built. I know, you know, the, the level of expectation that's all around you from friends and family and all those things. And um, I wouldn't expect that somebody that who didn't go to one of those uh, uh, schools would would know that. Um, but because I do know that, I can accept that. I think early in my career, it was like, are these people as as talented or as good or as capable as like all the folks that, from Stanford that are getting all the funding? Like, I'm may, maybe there's something I'm missing. But uh, what I've come to realize is. Of course not. Like, you know, these people are just as talented and ambitious and driving uh, uh, towards successful outcomes as as, uh, as the folks who typically get back. They just haven't been part of the inner circle to receive the capital and resources to be able to shine. So that's what we're hoping to correct for on some level. Absolutely. And I think that's a perfect segue into my my next point and you bringing that up. Um, so based on everything that you learned from your learned experience or your lived experience, so to speak, as you mentioned it, what are some of the signs of success in pitching founders that you've seen? Yeah. Um, so I think founders, uh, <laughs> founders come into categories in my opinion and both are good um or i should say good founders come in two categories um one is missionaries and one is mercenaries and uh missionaries are people that are like i'm building this company because it is my life's work to like bring this thing into fruition and um and like i'm so passionate about this particular thing like I don't care about being an entrepreneur. I don't care about like all this, but like this thing needs to exist uh, or the world needs to have this. Um, and, and then there's mercenaries and mercenaries are like, I, I have a particular set of skills <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that, that enable me to start, you know, a, a business that could be very, very successful and I can pull all the pieces together to make it happen. And, and again, both could be, um, uh, very successful. And I could point to dozens of examples of each. Um, um, but where I found, find myself gravitating to more is the missionary where people are just die hard about, about bringing something to fruition and probably even less, you know, like, of course they, they're doing it through the mechanism, through the vehicle of a, of a business opportunity. But it's it's, you know, they're they're equally excited about like the idea of something existing that they wanted to exist. And usually it comes from a very deep rooted experience or 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 perspective of like, this is the way the thing should be. And if the world's not going to bring it there automatically, I'm going to dedicate, you know, a decade of my life to try at least to trying to push it in that direction. 
And so a lot of these folks, um, I mean, you hear it in how they talk about their business. You hear it in how they talk about, you know, what they want to, what they want to back. And, um, you know, and, it, and, it, and it's exciting to get behind and support them on their journey. You know, as an investor, we are uh, somewhere between a, 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 you know, a cheerleader and a coach. And, uh, and, but, but undoubtedly, the founder is the star player. Absolutely. I love all of those analogies. Um, as a sales manager, I, I kind of say I'm in between a cheerleader and coach as well. Uh, so I, I relate to that. Um, but it, it's awesome, I, I bet, to hear you know the passion and, and where that comes from, from all of these founders, especially in you know that missionary example uh, that you're talking about. And now, uh, not to put you on the spot, Austin, but you did mention that you can point to a, a few examples of each of those. Would you mind sharing that with our users, what you would consider a, a missionary versus a mercenary? mercenary? Uh, sure. <laughs> I could go, I'll, I'll go, um, let's see, in, in broader, in the broader tech ecosystem, uh, uh, people that can um, build multiple businesses that almost don't really have anything to do with each other are uh, successfully are are uh mercenaries uh travis kalanick is in in many ways is a is a mercenary he can build a, a black car service and build a into into a, a you know transportation revolution <laughs> and then could also build uh, he's doing the same thing with food i don't know travis personally at all um so, so maybe he might agree, disagree with my position on it, but, um, but I, I think that he, you know, is, is particularly skilled on, on something like that. I'm trying to think of, uh, other folks that might be, uh, more missionary is, uh, the Airbnb founding team. Um, you know, they are so deeply passionate about connecting the world and, and having, people be able to live in other people's shoes and experience other people and basically bring people together in that way. Um, that like Airbnb is like one version of that manifestation that obviously worked out quite well as a, as a business. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I bring those two examples as probably the, the two most successful company, some of the two of the most successful companies that were born in the last decade or a little bit more than the last decade. Um, uh, um, and, and, and as kind of contrasting the different, um, ideas behind those, uh, but also happy to go into like our portfolio and talk about some of those examples as well. Um, again, most of them are, are missionaries. Uh, that was perfect. That was a great overview. And, and hopefully that, that taught us a lot. It was really good to hear your understanding of it and, and learn from from you the way that you kind of see those companies. So appreciate that there. Um, moving on to, to kind of Crexy here. So full transparency for some of our listeners, you're one of Crexy's earliest investors. Uh, so what attracted you to the tech sector? Um, what are some other investments that you're really excited about? Yeah, so um, we were an early investor in Crexy at 10110, which again was my prior firm. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we saw the opportunity, uh, met the founding team and, and saw their vision for, uh, what they could bring to commercial real estate and, uh, saw, you know, some scrappy young folks that were, you know, again, out to win <laughs> and, <laughs> and we're going to knock down walls. And if they get punched in the face, they get back up and keep going. And um, I, I don't know that I've seen, you know, a founding team like as resilient as, as Crexy, um, you know, pl went through pl plenty of challenges in the early days and then but kept going and uh, and has built something that now the the entire industry is uh, is familiar with and, and tons of folks rely on every day. So um, that's super exciting. Um, and and I guess to the rest of your question about like, is it is it other tech sec 
other areas in tech or what was the question? I, I'm sorry. I went off on a crazy rant. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I absolutely love it and, and appreciate those kind words. It's it's definitely what drives me every morning and just continuing to grow and, and bounce and crazy to the moon <laughs> personally, yeah. of course. Um, but the second question was, what are some other investments that you're really excited about? Yeah. Um, uh, we're excited about all our investments, but, um, you know, the, the, the way that, the way that I could think about what we do or sort of how, how, what Slauson and Co is, is we're investing in two particular categories. Um, the first is tools and platforms that support small business owners. Um, so SMB tech specifically. And then the second is culturally relevant consumer tech. So things that are speaking very directly or very specifically to certain populations or demographics and building products and services just for them. Um, and and so, you know, all pretty much our entire po- portfolio falls into one of those two categories. And, uh, you know, we're seeing all kinds of companies that are doing extremely well, uh, like on the small business tech. Our very first investment was in a company called Compliant. It's spelled like Compliant, except it's with a Y, so C O M. P L Y A N T. Um, um, so compliant. Uh, uh, the uh, 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 again, a missionary is uh, the founder Shiloh Johnson. Um, you know, African American woman um, was a CPA by trade. She worked with a lot of small businesses in and around the area where she was, which is in South LA. Um, and a lot of those businesses ran into often the same challenge around taxes that that had to do with not the federal tax, but all the other taxes that are surrounding the business. A lot of small business owners will get some notice in the mail that says they owe something in taxes, might stuff it away in an envelope or I mean, in a in a desk or something and say, I'll deal with it later. Those things end up collecting fees and penalties and interest on those fees and penalties and it compounding into a really big issue. And Shiloh spent a lot of time cleaning that up for for a lot of business owners. And she did it so frequently, she thought that it made sense to productize what she was doing. And so she created a product that's for these small business owners and um, to help them relieve the stress associated with staying on top of your taxes. Um, and that company continues to sort of exceed expectations. They have a great product that they rolled out of the gate with. But they are building it into something that's like completely automates the the entire process. And it's really, really exciting. So, you know, all small business owners, I recommend check out uh, uh, um, compliant as a as a as a product. So, you know, uh, again, going back to her passion and her, her, her mission, she's she's really helping people out at scale and it could be, make a massive difference to uh, small business owners, which are the drivers of this entire economy. That's a great story. I wonder if she does that for individuals. <laughs> Speaking of taxes, I still need to file mine, but we'll get to it. We'll get to it. I was very much relating to to that person that files everything away in the drawer. Blood pressure, as you think about it. I know, my mind just went up. It's the same thing with everybody. Everybody, like, nobody's like, yay, it's tax time. <laughs> It's, it's the same stress associated whether you're on top of it or not. And so, you know, it's good to see it alleviated. Absolutely. And that's definitely a need. So everyone, small business owners, check check them out for sure. Thanks for sharing that story with us. Um, sure so in, in terms of your, you know, ethos uh, in, in regarding investments, um, what is that? Uh, do you have one? And then how do you identify founders and companies in which to invest? I know we touched on it a little bit, um, but for you personally. Yeah. Um, so the ethos, Slosser & Co. is rooted in economic inclusion. Um, yep. That's what we're about. Um, and what that means is creating more opportunities for more people. Um, um, and and we, we want to create these economic opportunities through like either there's like empowering more small business owners, as in we back the tech that empowers more small business owners or um, or situations uh, where it's more consumer oriented, but it's around a population that's been historically underserved. Um, and so when I think about like the ethos and sort of what we look for to your question about in, in founders, 
Um, another thing we say internally quite a bit is, you know, we want to find people that are um, delusional with their vision and pragmatic with their execution. And, and, and it's like, you know, we want people that, that really want to change the world or, or, or certainly their, their corner of the world or their category um, and become category leaders and, and, and have transformative ideas for what this can be if successful and could be able to articulate that and why it should exist. And then at the same time, um, we know that like you don't get there <laughs> without starting to to understand the at least the first what the first few steps look like with a high degree of clarity, um, like painting the entire roadmap for how your business is going to evolve over the last over the next 10 years is a fool's errand. But like it. But with that being said, like there are some like, all right, well, I know the foundation of it has to be X. And, and, and so the next 12 months, we're focused on building out, you know, this product, this feature, and this other thing. And we're talking to this specific type of customer. And, uh, and that, that the level of clarity is what gets us excited on the execution side. And the level of ambition is what gets us excited on the vision side. That's perfect. I, I think that's going to be the new coined uh, coined phrase. Two two topics kind of came up, right? Um, kind of tired and true. If your dreams don't scare you, right, they're not big enough. So I love that, you know, be delusional in, in your idea, but pragmatic in your execution because, you know, everyone says you have a plan until you get punched in the face, right? So if you're planning out right. those 10 years, uh, especially in a business world, things can change so quickly, but you do have to have at least the first couple of steps. So I, I really resonate with that, Austin. I think I'm going to steal that from you. I'll give you credit, of course, but I'm going to start using it. Say that you made it up. You could, you could take full credit for it. Say Austin got it from me. I'm fine. <laughs> Appreciate that. Well, we, we did it together. It's a team effort. We did it together. I'm fine with that. <laughs> awesome. Um, so let's talk about, you know, the past year and a half, right? A lot's happened uh, with COVID and civil rights activism. So how has the sector and kind of public attitude changed regarding inclusion in the investment and startup space, in your opinion, Austin? Yeah, that's a good question. And obviously, it's been a it's been in, uh, a very different time than any other point in our lifetime. Um, so, so the, uh, I guess I should, I should set the scene of basically we started to put together this fund or start talking about putting together the fund about two years ago. Um, so this is like mid 2019. Um, and you know, we were still very much telling the story of inclusion uh, still very much talking about, you know, making sure that the, the tech ecosystem and the startup ecosystem broadly, um, it, it, that, that people really had a shot at bringing their ideas, um, to fruition if they had the goods to make it happen. Um, the idea of making it more of a meritocracy than what it has been historically. Um, and, you know, we had that message and we had that positioning um, for a while. And I think that people were moderately interested or curious and kind of felt like, oh, you know, like that's 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 cute or that's a that's a nice to have. And hopefully, you know, good luck with that. And um, I don't know that there was any kind of urgency around uh, getting behind that concept. So, you know, we struggled to, to raise capital for the fund. Um, uh, you know, we were raising, we started out with the idea of raising a $15 million. So very small fund, um, to, to, uh, put that capital together and put it to work. Um, so after the murder of George Floyd, uh, obviously quite a bit changed and the conversations changed, the tone changed, um, and more and more de people were dedicated or, 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 or publicly stated their commitments to diversity and inclusion. And um, I think that, that impacted nearly every industry and within the venture capital ecosystem and the, the limited partners that invest in funds like ours, um, we became top of mind for a lot of different people. So we were telling, again, the same story 
uh, but got a lot more interest and a lot more support from people. Um, you know, we went from, yeah, we went from raising a $15 million fund to raising a $50 million fund, which was our, our actual first uh, real goal. That was our target real fund. The first one was called like a concept fund, but we said, well, let's skip the concept because we have enough interest and enough demand from people that are now much more motivated, uh, to get behind something like this. And, um, you know, fundraising accelerated quite a bit for us. We got we got a, a lot of really, really good people uh, to get behind us. Uh, some like tech luminaries like uh, Ron Conway of SV Angel, um, uh, Jeff Wilkie, who is at Amazon. Uh, he, was, he just recently retired, but he was CEO of Worldwide uh, Consumer at Amazon. Um, and then we got great we got great corporations as well behind us. So folks like. Uh, PayPal um, and uh, and Google, you know, large tech companies that, that wanted to put capital to work behind what we're doing um, and pour resources to the types of founders that we were backing. Um, and so, you know, things picked up quite a bit, to say the least. And uh, it's created a lot of new opportunity for us to move ahead uh, and bring our vision to fruition. So, the, the landscape made all the difference in the world. You know, we didn't necessarily change. Our experience hadn't changed. Our skill set hadn't changed. Uh, but people started to take notice and started to, to, to care over the last essentially year. Absolutely. And it's great to see that people are listening because that the work that you're doing over there is needed. Right. And it's been needed. And, and now you're getting the funds and the capital and, and things like that to support, you know, what needs to be supported. So appreciate all your efforts and, and looking forward to seeing you guys continue to strive. My question to you is, uh, where do you think that kind of Silicon Valley VC world is? Um, where are they on the path towards a more inclusive landscape? Any suggestions or thoughts on next steps that need to be taken in order for them to get there as well? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, even with all of what happened over the last year and the attention and the and sort of the the intention as well I, I i still feel like we're in very early innings of of creating a more inclusive um landscape for for founders um you know the reality is like the the venture capital model as it stands for most venture capitalists is not broken as in it's provided the types of returns above like the traditional publicly traded public markets um uh that it said it would provide um and you know and top funds are going well well above that um and so the reality is it looks like things are working and so the the people that are in the industry in many cases don't have a whole lot of incentive to say all right let me you know rip out what what I know to be working and and move on um and as a result of that change has been really really slow um uh i don't think that that's going to hold for very much longer like the reality is i think consumers demand a different experience and they're supporting companies based on their values and uh their and and things that they want to identify with and i don't think that you can play the game the way that it's been played historically and still win. Um, I think that you do have to, if you look at the changing demographics of the country, uh, you do have to have people from various backgrounds. If you do look at the like women and uh, entrepreneurs, like continuing to ramp and continuing to, to, to start more companies at a faster rate than men. Like it's insane. The idea that, that, that men still get, you know, 95% of the capital that's allocated. Like, um, so all of these stats to me look like something that is broken that, that when there is a turn in the market, it will be very sharp and very abrupt. And if you're not prepared for that turn, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> and um and and the way to prepare for that turn is to get people in the door working for for these firms 
or starting their own firms that have a different perspective, that are connected to these communities, that do bring new ideas to the table, that don't need, you know, only the the same traditional backgrounds um, to, to sort of check the boxes in order to feel comfortable making an investment there. Um, and when you get people with different perspectives, with different life experiences, you're going to get different types of investments and you're going to attract different types of founders as well. And and ultimately, I think that's what's going to drive returns, you know, over the next decade. Um, we'll see. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm betting my entire career on it. I could I couldn't agree more with you Austin and and I love to hear that even you know us as as individuals getting different people's perspective and kind of going outside of your own box is just going to help you as a person grow and and learn so I absolutely love that and and completely agree with you um, yeah. I, I want to talk about a article that you had written on Medium. So uh, it's called The Delusion Around Inclusion. So for those listeners that maybe haven't read it, um, definitely check it out. But Austin, will you give us a quick synopsis of the article and then talk about a little bit about what drove you to actually write the article? Sure. Um, the what actually drove me to start the article was or to write the article was actually uh my partner and i my partner's name is aj Rilan, uh when we went out to raise capital for our fund and we were talking about creating a more inclusive ecosystem um we kept getting met with the same responses um that are probably the same responses that most listeners here um you know would just inherently think about what you know, what the challenges would be to doing something like that and the implications of that. And uh, as a result of that, you know, like we spent a lot of time talking through those ideas and through those challenges and those perceptions that people have. Um, And again, they're not, they're not, it's not that they're dumb or, or that they're like evil. It's just that like, it's just like, when you take your worldview and then, and then apply what I just said to that worldview, it it sounds like oh okay so so certain things so the most common one for example is that we're going after like a a, a niche market um and and that's in the sense of like oh you're you know you want to back more um like right now there's one percent of founders are are african american like two percent of founders are 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 latinx or something like that basically collectively they're three percent i'll say um and so when i would say like we're we're, we're, like we expect that our portfolio will strongly over index on people from underrepresented backgrounds like black and latinx um the idea was like oh you're going after that three percent and you're trying to get the best of that three percent and 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 it felt like oh that's that's a niche market but you know like in terms of actually producing returns like is that going to be quite limiting and for us, we say um, we're not going after that three percent. We're not going after this one little niche. What we're actually going after is this massive population that's been drastically underserved, you know, across the country. Um, and again, if you look back to the demographics of the of, of the U.S., um, uh, I, I, I you'll you'll see that like things are changing, and and certainly. Um, evolving uh, in favor of of, of ma- a majority minority country in, in not too long from now. So if you're not thinking about how to speak to different voices and different populations, then again, I think you're missing the boat. But but even taking it a step further, I think I think when I think about what a niche market is, it's like it's it's when you're looking at a a, a very specific like subset or or, or a specific profile, and you're trying to to um, extract as much value as you possibly can from that one particular profile. And that is by definition what Silicon Valley is currently doing. So like in my view, I view, I view this as like a niche market that's now hyper competitive because there are thousands of venture firms all going after the same few founders, whereas there's substantially fewer venture firms going after the types of founders that we're, we're talking about backing. Um, so you know that was one that was one of the big ideas uh behind there but i'd encourage folks to uh read the article if uh if 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 they want to know more 
Absolutely. It was great reading that. And and I think that's just a huge testament and um, everything that you just explained on why firms like yours are essential in the world of venture capital and, and making sure that these markets are serviced. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. I mean, I, I hope that we could expose people to different ways of thinking that could ultimately uh, create more equitable outcomes for, for everyone, but also uh, still lead to great performance. Um, so that was it. We've never wanted to compromise or never thought about ourselves as compromising on returns at all. We, we, we would only pursue something if we thought that we could outperform. And, um, and this is a category that we think when we bet on it, ultimately over the long run, it'll outperform. Exactly. Perfect. So moving into, um, a little bit of nonprofits, right? So outside of venture capital, you also run Grid 110 and Lead Pledge LA. So can you talk about each of these organizations, their missions, and share some of their successes for us? Sure. Uh, I'll talk about um, Grid 110 first. So Grid 110 is a nonprofit accelerator uh, that, that takes no fee and, and also takes no equity from the companies that go through the program uh, that's based here in L.A. It's based in downtown L.A. Um, and the program has been around for about six years, uh, run about 200 companies have gone through the program. Um, and they've gone on to you know raise capital uh, or go to other accelerators like Y Combinator or TechStars or um, or just you know or just continue to, to uh, bootstrap and and grow by themselves independent of, of additional outside capital. And um, so Grid One Ten also has a phenomenal track record of diversity and inclusion. Seventy uh, percent of the founding teams have uh, a woman. On the founding team, 70% of the founding teams have a person of color, um, and so it's it it is it just says a lot about like the types of talent that um, a program like that could attract. Um, uh, and I so Grid 110, I, I I got involved with Grid 110 early, specifically to expand the program to South LA, um, which again falls aligned with our thesis. One of the other things uh, that, that people just assumed was like, there's not a lot of entrepreneurs that are pursuing really innovative ideas in these areas that have not historically produced a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, um, uh, that, that are build breakout companies or whatnot. And m my argument was always like, oh, no, they're there. They, you know, they might not be connected to the same resources. But like if you're talking about a level of intelligence, a level of drive, a level of creativity, it's there. Um, and so we actually created a program focused on South L.A. last summer, uh, and we had um, almost 100 uh, uh, applications come in over just a three-week period uh, from, from entrepreneurs just in the South L.A. area, um, which was phenomenal. We ended up selecting 19 companies that went through that program. And actually, one of them was Shiloh Johnson, which was the person that I just mentioned uh, who runs the company Compliant. Um, uh, and so that was how we connected with her. So, so uh, Grid 110 continues to grow, continues to expand, uh, always coming up with new ideas for new programs. If you, if, if you have an idea that you're, you're working on or building out and you're early in your business, I highly, highly recommend you check out Grid 110. It's grid110.org. Um, and that's run uh, primarily by Mickey Reynolds. Uh, who's who's a good friend and one of the most forward thinking um, investors and innovators that I know in LA. Um, so so I'd highly recommend checking that out. Um, the other organization that you mentioned was Pledge LA. Um, Pledge LA was an initiative that was created between Annenberg Foundation and Mayor Garcetti's office uh, uh, a little over two years ago, two and a half years ago. Um, I was fortunate enough to be named chair of that organization. So so I ran it for the first couple of years existence. Um, and Pledge LA was designed to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion across the tech community in LA. Um, there are about 70 venture firms um, that have signed on to take this pledge. Uh, there are about 100 some odd uh, tech startups that have taken this pledge, including Crexy, uh, which is awesome. And uh, the idea was to, was to uh, have also accountability around 
around how people are doing. So there's a survey that's sent out every year or every other year um, that will where where companies sort of assess themselves and their employee base and see how they're doing on all these metrics. Um, uh, and then we publish the reports, uh, which sort of broadly say how the city is doing um, each year. So you could go to PledgeLA.org and, and, and check out any one of the reports. Uh, but some of the other interesting things that we did with Pledge LA were, were we um, played, we had an internship program for people from underrepresented backgrounds to break into venture capital. Again, a notoriously difficult industry to break into, but we had some people come in and join us um, from, you know, that would have otherwise maybe not had a path to being an intern at a venture capital firm here in LA. And at this point, we've placed probably 30 uh, uh, students into, into different venture capital firms over the last couple of years. Um, and, uh, yeah. And so, so there's continues to be a bunch of other programs that, that promote diversity and equity and inclusion and, and it's actively going and now it's run by, uh, Kiana Patterson, who's, uh, phenomenal and again, brilliant mind and lots of great ideas for where she wants to take the organization. Well, thank you so much for that background about both of those companies, Austin. For our listeners, definitely check them both out. I know that we have a lot of mentors here at Crexy for Pledge LA. Everyone absolutely loves it. Um, and that kind of is leading me to my next point. And I know we talked about this in the beginning, Austin, um, but mentorship, right? I think that mentorship is significant on both ends, both for the mentor and the mentee. But in your experience, why is mentorship so significant in the success of founders and entrepreneurs that maybe you've worked with, uh, particularly those who historically haven't had the access to mentorship or capital? Yeah, um, mentorship is critical. Uh, as I said, my, my first mentors were, were bloggers who literally didn't know my name. Um, but, like, but, but once I got to a place where there were people that did know my name and did want to help out directly, it kind of did the same thing, but just accelerated, um, you know, accelerated the things that I wanted to accomplish. It helped me overcome or, or, or get past any, any challenges that I had. Like if I could learn from somebody else who's been doing this for 30 years and they, and they see me about to make a mistake and they kind of take my shoulders and steer me in a different direction, um, then, you know, it, it, it saves me the pain or the, or the challenges that I would have to go through uh, had they not been there. So when I think of mentors, I talked about David Waxman as well, but like, uh, you know, more recently, there's there's probably a couple people that really come to mind. One is Ron Conway from SV Angel, who I, who I mentioned. Uh, he's uh, uh, been super supportive of, of all the work that we're doing and, and opened up his way of thinking, which challenged a lot of the ideas that I had about venture capital and, and how to be successful. Um, but it's, but it's, but it's also, um, uh, just, just the support and, and knowing that somebody is there for you, uh, it, it just makes so much difference. Um, and then another mentor is Jason Green of Emergence Capital. So Jason, uh, Emergence is like one of the premier firms, uh, in the Bay for, uh, for enterprise, uh, companies enterprise cloud-based companies and uh, they are phenomenal and, and jason built that firm a couple decades ago and has has continued to grow it and so when i think about where we'll take slawson over the years like just seeing everything that he's navigated um um it's been tremendously valuable for me um and 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 he's very very selfless and i think that was the other thing that even i struggle with as a mentee is I've, I've always been so self-sufficient. And so like, if I need to get to a goal, I'm going to make it happen. And I don't need to rely on anybody or whatever. I weird stuff. I tell myself, I think that like the, the, I think when you have good mentors, you know, they call you out on it. And they also, they also open the doors for you that you would not be able to do for yourself. And, and that happens time and time again. You know, when I, when I say I need help here, when I say, you know, I could use some advice or whatever, uh, those folks step up for me big time and uh, create a lot of uh, uh, support for what I'm doing. 
I, I agree with that completely. I'm, I like to say that I'm super independent and, you know, kind of wear that as a badge of honor. You know, I can do this myself, but in reality, we all need help, right? And we can all ask for it. And I think, you know, being a mentor to some teammates and colleagues and even friends, you know, it, it gives you value as well. So sometimes we think we're a burden if we ask for help, but really it's giving the other person purpose and they enjoy it, you know, even more than, than you asking for help. So kind of remembering that in the back of your head is, is a good perspective that I've taken <laughs> to make it easier to ask for that. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And it's kind of funny because like, I, I cause I, I mentor a, 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 a few people and, and that's always it. Like, I, I get particularly like when I get kids from like neighborhoods like where I grew up, they they, they give me that look like why are you here? Like <laughs> like you could you could be out doing something else. Like why are you talking to me about my little thing? And and for me, I'm like all that other stuff is the secondary stuff. Like I'm here. Like this is this is what drives me. This is what motivates me is making sure that the next generation of folks have have a have a path forward. So. Um, so I completely agree. You got to keep in mind, you know, that mentors often get so much more uh, out of the relationship than, than you do in many cases. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Same page on that. Um, thanks for sharing for, for sharing your stories. Um, so question on um, the nonprofit. So both Grid 110, Pledge LA, as well as your firm, Slauson & Co. focus a lot on local Los Angeles-based startups. So how does investing in, in small local businesses drive the economic uh, development of those neighborhoods? Sure. So um well, one, I, I have to clarify that uh, Sloss & Co. certainly invests nationally. I mean, we're, we're, oh, we're rooted in L.A. Okay. Um, we're, 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 our name is very, very L.A. And, um, <laughs> but uh, but we, we are investing across the country. Um, um, uh, Grid 110 is, is also like starting to touch more areas across the country as well. So there is some sort of expansion there. Pledge L.A., will always be LA, but there are, uh, Pledge LA's influenced and, and, and excited a lot of other organizations, again, across the country in different areas, different cities who want to do something similar. So all of those, the, the, the reach is there. Um, but with that said, there is absolutely something to be said for like supporting uh, the development, the economic development of, of, of our local neighborhoods. Um, you know, this is what I grew up around. This is what I know the most. This is where I can speak to uh, the unique challenges of of, of people. Um, you know, I, I uh, grew up playing tennis at, at uh, Harvard Park, which is actually right off of Slauson. Um, and, and, you know, I saw a lot of the challenges that that neighborhood had. And, um, and now, you know, I'm fortunate enough to pledge L.A., to be involved with building a teen tech center in conjunction with Vermont Slauson Economic Development Corporation. That's literally a block away from, from that area. Um, and so like when I think about what we could be doing to be more meaningful and have, and, and like drive change that's lasting, uh, it, it starts with what you know the best and it starts with what you know and because you understand all the nuances of the challenges that, that the local environment faces. And, um, you know, I, I think that there's a phenomenal, uh, uh, there's so many ways to get involved, so many people that, that, that need help and support. And if you're just volunteering 10% of your time, donating 10% of the money you make, um, you, you, you can make a massive difference uh, with the trajectory of, of your city uh, as a whole. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. And, you know, creating these new businesses and giving them the the runway um, is just going to increase the economy and kind of stimulate those areas as well. So that's all, yeah. that's all great. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, 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 I think when you when we do see that, when we see more um, companies and more investment in like your local community, it does create more job opportunities, which in turn creates um, you know, more wealth and, and, uh, and better solutions and better products where people can take pride in, in their community and what's being built up and they can own it themselves. And, 
and, and participate in the growth of the community themselves as well. So, um, you know, I, I, I think when I look at like Craigsy uh, that, that, and, and the folks that are probably listening to this, uh, you know, I, I, so much of it depends on like how you do commercial real estate and how you involve, uh, communities that are, that are nearby, higher local, um, to the extent that you can, um, and, and invest in the community outside of just the property that you own. Um, you know, it's part of a living, breathing, breathing community. And so I'm, I, I, I love when, when, when there are outside people that come into new communities, if they're become deeply ingrained with what the community is about and the values and the, and the leaders there and have them involved with, with different projects as well. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I, I, I couldn't have summed that up any better myself, Austin. That was, that was a beautiful way to, you know, kind of encapsulate everything that we've been talking about. So really appreciate that there. Um, and then we're coming up to, to kind of the end of our podcast here. Yeah. Uh, have one more topic that all of our listeners love is some advice from you. So I have two questions on this. So firstly, what advice do you have for your fellow investors who are seeking to invest more equitably? Sure. Uh, if you're seeking to invest more equitably, um, step out of your comfort zone and uh, also uh, step out of <laughs> basically step out of your comfort zone and talk to talk to more people who have different life experience, very different life experiences than you do. Um, and and then also, I'd say uh challenge yourself on the idea that investing more equity um equates to compromised returns um the reality is i don't think that that's the case uh i think it's kind of been proven in many different a asset classes that that's not the case to date but um over the next decade or so i think i'll go a step further and say that that is going to be the optimal way to invest. Otherwise, uh, you'll be leaving money on the table. So, um, so yeah. So I think really challenging yourself, talking to other people, seeing what what other people think is exciting, or where where they think industries are going, or or categories are going. Everything from retail to like, uh, you know, to 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 local service shops or anything like that. Um, uh, yeah, you can get out of your comfort zone and talk to people. That's great advice, Austin. I love that, you know, change your mindset, get different opinions, different perspectives. You're going to grow as a person and then, of course, as an investor. So great advice there. Uh, and then secondly, what advice do you have for founders and entrepreneurs starting their journeys? Um. Uh, let's see, founders and entrepreneurs starting their journeys. My advice is, is that, you know, if, if you're crazy enough to decide to start a business and dedicate your all to it, um, the one thing that, uh, I guess I would say you really want to lean on is, again your 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 life your life experience and know that it all counts know that that random job that you had when you were in between jobs and and it didn't work out and you know that you didn't do a good job there and nobody there likes you or whatever <laughs> like like <laughs> you still got something out of that um you you still learn some some trade or some trick or something like that and it's going to come and, and and you're going to have to apply that uh to your to your entrepreneurial journey um you know when you're an entrepreneur you have to pull out all stops you have to you have to uh take every single utilize every single tool that you have available um and 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 i think that that's what gets me excited to work with entrepreneurs is like there, there is no holding back. There is a, it's just sort of moving forward with whatever I can possibly use to, to overcome whatever obstacle that I have and, and everything that you have to use, all the tools that you built or all the experience that you've had in the past, good, bad, all of it. 
bring it all to the table. Absolutely. That's so rich. That's so rich. You know, every, everything is meaningful and you can find lessons in everything. So I love that piece of advice there for us, Austin. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights, especially on such an important topic. Uh, we appreciate your time today. I know you're very busy. So thanks for taking the time to sit down with us. Um, Austin, where can people find you online if they want to get in touch? Uh, they can find me online at, uh, well, you can find me on Twitter. It's Austin LAC. Uh, those are my initials, Austin Lewis Anderson Clements. Um, so, Austin LAC, uh, or, uh, you know, you could look on our, our Instagram for Slauson and co, which is spelled out Slauson, A N D C O. Uh, actually that's both on Twitter and on Instagram. So follow us there and, uh, would love to hear from anybody. Feel free to reach out. Perfect. Thanks so much. And thanks to everyone who tuned in today. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure not to miss the next one. Visit go.crexi, that's C-R-E-X-I dot com backslash podcast and sign up to get the very next episode delivered straight to your inbox. Of course, you can also subscribe to the Crexi podcast on your favorite podcast app and check up our YouTube channel for video recordings of each episode. Goodbye, stay well, and be sure to tune in next time. Bye.